Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, theorems, or whatever algorithms biased collection, my very biased collection. The last one actually um, on this list, and I really wanted to do this one, although it's not really mathematics today. It will be more like history of science if you want, um, but it's one of the algorithms on my list, also you might say it's not really an algorithm. But it's on my list of the top algorithms of the century. Actually, not my list. It's on the list of the top algorithms of the century. Um, so I really wanted to do this. And it's, as I said, more of a history type of video today and less of a math type of video, which is obviously fine. So um, why does everything need to be math? Not everything is mathematics. And sometimes everything is mathematics and sometimes not everything is mathematics. And I really want to sell this point of the power of visualization. So here is uh, a car crash that is animated in some 3D visualization and you can literally see where the forces all go and, and whatever. So sometimes you have a math problem, Just think of it like this. And it's actually really difficult and although you can somehow write down whatever, a differential equation in this case, you can't really solve it. So sometimes it really just helps to analyze the problem by making a good illustration. Of so there are many, many ways of doing this and visualization is a phenomena of experiments of whatever is as old as science itself. It's like really crucial. Maybe something that is more mass would be like a proof without words. So here's a proof without words. So what am I proving here? Or what, what is proven here? Um, I give you a few seconds to think about it and then I will tell you. So hmm, what is this? This is a square and it's kind of nicely split off into one, three, five, seven, and so on. So the sum of the e odd numbers, the sum of the odd numbers up to a certain point is a square. Huh? That's something you can prove by induction if you want, or you just draw this picture. And I think this picture is really fantastic, right? The sum of the odd numbers is a square, and you literally can just see that. Yeah, there's another part of how visualization can be like a game changing. It could be really a game changer. And not just in mathematics, uh, not just good mathematics is well illustrated. Yeah, Times change, but Bucky would have told you that good mathematics is not illustrated. I tell you that good mathematics is well illustrated. Uh, so you really should use visualization techniques to make your point. Yeah? That's very important. But not just to make your point, but also kind of to maybe find an idea like here. So maybe you, you can just use this visualization to actually figure out what's going on in, in the car and what the kind of crucial parts are that you need to um, make stronger to, to better survive a car crash, right? Something like that. So visualization is like one of the crucial tools that really be kind, of, kind of started to fly in the last century. And why did it start to fly? Well, I claim, I might be a bit over the top, but I claim it also became successful because computer science, programming, became more accessible. It became more um, a general public phenomena instead of some very specific computer scientists know what to do type of phenomena. And this final algorithm I want to talk about is was essentially kind of the catalyst to this, well, explosion of programming languages. They came, became way more widely available. So nowadays, literally, most people I ever talk to have some Python um, experience, and Python is a really amenable uh, programming language. It's not terribly fast, but you can easily do your own things. And this is like so important and really pushes research and society as a general quite a bit. So um, yeah, today I will kind of try to tell you the story, how that all started in a little bit of a loose sense. So to really say this started everything, I would have need to run an experiment where I have a time frame where this actually happened, like like in our in our world, and I have another time frame where it didn't happen. But I certainly uh, can't really do that. Um, if anyone knows how to set up such an experiment where you can just run the if what if type thing, I would be happy to know that. Um, but anyway, so let me just go back to the good old days. So when I was young, all the computers were like this vacuum tube computers. Maybe it was even before my days. Who knows? I'm just very old. Um, and traditional programming was like very time consuming and essentially only for experts. There is nothing like Python. You don't do it at home on your laptop. It's 
very difficult. And what you should have in mind is like the keywords is like a punch card. Yeah? By the way, I don't know whether this is actually, I, I copied it from Wikipedia. Wikipedia said punched card. Uh, I would say punch card. Um, if anyone has any idea or preference, just let me know. But anyway, punched cards. You know what these guys are, those guys here. Paper tapes, magnetic tapes, or maybe a little bit more modern, this, those low-key um, languages. I know it's really, really... Uh, it, seriously, um, you really needed to be an expert to do anything, essentially. There was no... There was a good old times where you had no computer screen, there was no interaction between human and machine at all, and uh, this was uh, oh, the good old times. And this kind of the idea that happened around the 1950s uh, essentially was to make programming more accessible. Uh, programming is like really important nowadays. As I said, everyone somewhat can do it and there are some really good programming languages. Some can illustrate car crashes. Uh, LaTeX is in some sense a programming language if you want. And this is like where nowadays like 99.9% .9 of all scientific papers are written with. Something like this, right? So it's really important to make this accessible. And in the 1950s, it was just not. It was just not accessible. And it was not just because computers were like literally uh, very expensive and you don't have a laptop. It was also because the interaction with the computer was too difficult. And people came up with this idea kind of for the first time to make what I would call a modern programming language. Um, so low key programming language or high key, this is, would be a high key programming language. And it was Fortran. Um, and this was the first Fortran manual the good old times where you actually had a book in your hand turns out i don't own any books anymore uh, pff, only have everything on my computer but the good old times where you had a really large book and you can open it and look up various commands in uh, the book uh, the book came a little bit later as far as i know let me lie and the, the language itself was 55 and the book itself the first handbook on um, a high key programming language was in like 56 Anyway, it was Fortran, Formula Translation System, and it was really the breakthrough in the end. Not at that time, right? It took a while, but in the end it was really the breakthrough that made numeric and scientific computing accessible uh, to the public, not just to uh, the expert. No? And it was efficient enough to, at that point, the experts were the gatekeepers, and Fortran was effi effi uh, efficient enough to convince the gatekeepers to actually give it a shot, and eventually it's just more convenient and will just be much better. And nowadays, um, most languages are kind of high key languages. There are still some low key languages that, that you will, will be used. Um, but maybe that, I, I read a statistic a few days back and I think it was like 5% nowadays is just a low key language and the rest are the high key languages. But don't quote me on that. I don't even remember what I did yesterday and that was a few uh, days ago. But not me not not a high percentage anymore at this point uh, is a loki language so it's really the game changer uh, in the 1950s to make yeah computers more accessible programming more accessible and kind of the meta theorem i have for you and yeah i will uh, make this thing here a little bit bigger um, we can actually zoom in the meta theorem i have for you is um, that fortran in some sense was like the ancestor of the modern programming languages which is really the reason why it became feasible for non-experts and then really fired fueled the um scientific revolution so make let's make this thing a bit bigger here so fortran is one of the first ones it was influenced by speed coding which i'm literally a bit ignored in this video but anyway and then a lot of more kind of nowadays well-known and even still used programming language whatever pascal c I don't know what small talk is. I realize it now. It's actually a fun name. I should look that up. Anyway, C++ and whatever. They are all kind of inspired in some way uh, by Fortran. And I'm from that generation. I still learn something like basic C, Pascal and Visual Basic and C++ in school. The good old days where you learn those languages in school. Hopefully nowadays they don't do that anymore because there's a shift and the important shift to make programming more accessible by using kind of better accessible languages. So, but Fortran was kind of the start and it was already a, a large step. So C is not really an accessible language, right? It, it, there's still a lot of work involved. 
but it kind of was the start and nowadays you have something like Python which is super easy and very nice to work with actually. Essentially nowadays uh, it's so easy you could just ask ChatGPT to write you Python code. Um, that's what I do all the time anyway. So I'm not writing code anymore. So it was kind of useless that I learned whatever C in school. Um, but anyway, I, I still have to see skills. So maybe I shouldn't complain. Anyway, no such list can be perfect. And we went through all of them now. And I feel like all of them have their, their, their right to be there. Even if you might argue that Fortran is maybe not really an algorithm. So maybe it shouldn't be on the list of the algorithms of the century. Maybe maybe the curl of subspace method is not that important or something. So some little tiny, right? No list is perfect. Some little tiny iterations. But I feel like it's actually a really good list um, to close off the last century. And the idea for upcoming videos would be to discuss actually what happens in mathematics, uh, in the intersection of mathematics and computer science, how computer science and computers can fuel modern mathematics uh, from the viewpoint of this century and not from the viewpoint of the previous century. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.